If you're a large breed dog owner or you're about to become a large breed dog owner, you may face some unique challenges with your large breed dog training. So today, I've enlisted the help of Instructor Steve, who's a professional dog trainer and a multiple large breed dog owner with lots of experience training the largest of the large breed dogs. That's all in today's video. I'm Ken Steep. I'm Steve Walsh. And this is Sky. Welcome back to McCann Dogs. In our facility, we help more than 500 dog owners every single week to overcome their dog training challenges. So if this is your first time on the channel, make sure you hit that subscribe button so that I can help you to have a well-behaved four-legged family member. So looking forward uh, a little bit with your large breed puppy training, what sort of things are you gonna do unique to large breed dogs that are gonna prepare them for uh, you know this great size? Yeah, you know, one of the things that uh, has been really important, and I've learned this, this is my fourth wolfhound, um, that I learned quite quickly is, is getting them comfortable with my hands on them, getting them comfortable with me doing whatever I need to do, whether it be um, for grooming, for trimming nails, for lifting them up if they got injured, all of those things are important to really establish with them while you can still lift them. Sure. Okay, this dog is much stronger than I am. Uh, if I want to clip a nail and, and she doesn't like it, there's nothing I can do to force her. Mm -hmm. So getting her comfortable with my hands on her, getting her comfortable with me picking up a paw, opening up these toes, doing all the things that I need to do, and she goes, okay, not a big deal. Yeah. Um, getting her comfortable with me placing her in a down position at the vets on the floor, sure. just uh, have a look at her abdomen. All of that stuff, if I can get them comfortable with it now, mm -hmm. it's so much easier as they become adults because they're bigger and stronger than us. They can, we can't force them to do anything. Right. Um, and I don't want it to be about that. I want to make it relaxing for them. I want to make it comfortable for them. I want to make them confident, not only in my handling, but in the situation that they're in and their trust in me. Yep. And that starts right from the moment that we, that we get them home. Yeah, I think that's such an important thing. And I, and I think it's something that we often overlook um, as, you know, we're teaching puppy owners, you know, puppy owners don't really see the value of some of the handling exercises. And I can totally understand having seen Sky grow up that, uh, you know, the, you really do need to spend extra time making her comfortable when, when she's a more manageable size mm -hmm. because uh, she did get really big in a Really, hurt. really quickly. As far as training, what other uh, things are you going to work on with your large breed dog? Um, well, all of the stuff that we would do with uh, with the smaller dogs, you know, they, they learn the same way that, uh, that some of the smaller dogs do. I mean, I have border collies, I've had whippets. Uh, as I said, she is my fourth wolfhound. Um, the practices are the same, but you know, their ability to work f as quickly isn't the same. Mm -hmm. um, also, their ability to repeat things isn't the same. You know, she's a big dog. She's yeah. not going to do things 10 or 15 times. So when I do things, I like to break it into shorter sessions. Um, let her be successful two or three times, I currently, and then uh, let her kind of wander off and have a little rest. Yeah, right? so sure. um, if we break it into a little, little bit more shorter sessions, she can be a little bit more successful and stay focused. She doesn't. She's not interested in doing things repetitively like some other breeds maybe right and a lot of larger dogs you know we don't want to push them too hard yeah especially during their growth and development so things right. like walking i'm not going to take her for big long walks right off the bat yeah we will do little bits and pieces more about teaching them to walk than actually walking them different places. okay that's really interesting and it is unique to large breed dogs one other thing that oh you and mentioned, by the way get, get used to yeah, being sat on yes i'm about to, i'm about to be shoved over <laughs> even though them. they even though they are big i have no problem with them being a lap dog it's no, just fine okay. you just need a bigger lap <laughs> <laughs> you did mention something that was i thought was really unique you mentioned to me something about um, the stairs that maybe some of our other large breed dog owners uh, have heard as well. Yeah, um, the common notion is that with our, you know, especially larger giant breed dogs, that we shouldn't let them do stairs until they're uh, fully developed or adults. You know, these puppies are really awkward when they are young. They've got giant paws and legs that go everywhere. And it's true, you don't want them freely going up and down stairs um, and possibly hurting themselves by slipping and falling. You know, there's a lot of momentum when these dogs go head first downstairs. Right. I will tell you the story though, I made the mistake with, with one of my first wolfhounds that I heated that. I did not uh, have him do stairs until about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Um, and then when I decided I wanted him to come upstairs, he had no idea how to do the stairs. And it took a lot of time because he was already really, really big. And um, I, the way my house is, I sort of have like five steps up to the one level. So I was using food to try and lure him up. The problem was he could walk up all five steps with his front paws right. and keep his rear paws I see. on the ground floor. Right, so right. it really took a lot to convince him to use all his paws. Yeah. So yes, I very much support not letting um, larger dogs do uh, sets of stairs on their own. But I spend time now, I've learned that um, 
Uh, I teach my puppies when they're young in a very controlled manner how to safely navigate stairs versus freely run up and down. Okay. And that's just as simple as making sure I have a leash on them, having some really great food, and maybe I start with the two steps down off the deck or I find a couple of steps somewhere outside and really think about getting them aware of their feet and really doing it nice and slow, rewarding every step. She's actually my best at going downstairs. She's very uh, calm and she takes things one step at a time, which is fantastic because yeah. of course I got a five-year-old son in the house. Sure. I don't want 130 pounds of puppy be crashing through everybody so yeah. she can quite safely navigate down any sets of stairs yeah and that brings to mind when you mentioned uh, that you have a son at home um, introducing your dog to your other dogs you know having uh, family members included in the training let's talk a little bit about that with these large breed dogs yeah so like anything else I need to set them up for success but also taking into account their size and you know what can happen with them um, when she was about a year old she was uh, 105 pounds uh, my you know my older border collie right now is 29 pounds yeah uh, so even though this dog wanted to run and play and dogs get along swimmingly to have an uncoordinated 105 pounds of dogs inadvertently yeah here's that. Yeah, I, I, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah that happens it's okay. like a wind tunnel yeah, yeah yeah you look like that <laughs> um, inadvertently knock over a smaller dog or yeah. a small child sure. you know can create some problems there are some responsibilities that we have with these larger breed dogs because you know if they bump into something they're gonna knock it over yeah um, you know family members you know that maybe are a little bit older you know if this dog throws a hip into them they're they're going to be knocked over. Right. So you have to be conscious of those types of things and um, be mindful by managing it firstly, yep. uh, making sure you have a leash on the dog and uh, then helping train them how to you know, greet people properly in a mannerly fashion. Yeah, I really like the idea of using a house line in, in, with the large breeds. Certainly a house leash is helpful. Yes, yeah, and I would say you'd qualify that with leash because again, if you just put a little light line on a dog that's 70 or 80 pounds, sure. um, that's not something that's gonna be easy to hold on to, but going and getting a good wide uh, leash and cutting the handle off it can be a great way to sort of you know easily gain control of them safely yeah mm -hmm. not something I would recommend stepping on a leash very often <laughs> no, so, so but that's an important thing to keep in mind like right. oftentimes with a young puppy you can step on a house line or a house leash yep. and that sort of prevents them from moving forward <laughs> we're having a little fly guys making the most You'll notice we're this. both petting it yeah, in you know yeah neither of us have to reach and there she's are loving there aren't many videos we have on the channel where we can both pet yes. the same dog as, yeah. and I think she was trying to get on top of us. yeah yeah exactly <laughs> um, so you know with little puppies we may be able to simply step on a leash or a line and prevent them from going anywhere but with a bigger dog um, you want to be <laughs> sorry she's sniffing a camera <laughs> nose to nose uh, we want to be aware of that you know I might want to plan ahead a little bit more and have that leash or that line in my hands uh, and help them sort of navigate those situations a little more safely Sometimes people will mention to us that, oh, you know, my dog's a Dane. He doesn't like to listen. Or, oh, my dog's a, a, an X breed. And uh, sometimes I feel like um, because the larger breed dogs require a little different approach that some people have lower expectations of their dog training results. But we know that um, you can maintain those same expectations. Talk a little bit about the differences. While you're maintaining those same high expectations of your dog, how would you approach it a little bit differently with dogs that are this big? Yeah, any of the, the, the large or giant breed dogs, and, and oftentimes it comes with hounds. People say, oh, it's a hound. Oh, right. the hound doesn't learn. You know, all the dogs learn the same way. But if we keep in mind helping our dogs um, success rate, setting them up to be successful, they can learn just the same as any ones can, and we can keep those same high expectations. Yeah. When I ask her to lie down, I expect her to lie down quickly, yes. and I will help her achieve that. But I don't um, excuse it by saying, oh, she's gonna lie down when she feels like it, or a big one, especially with the bigger dogs, especially when they're growing, mm -hmm. which can take a lot of energy, we ask them to sit at our side. Right. And oftentimes those dogs will sort of slump down and slide into a down position. Right. You know, I can very clearly direct them back into a sit. Yep. Now, taking into account their body at that that point you know I would make sure I get a little bit of resolution on that set and make sure they are sitting on loose leash I might then to help them because they are giant breeds asking them to lie down but it is all about setting the expectation and on your terms exactly that's a really important takeaway for you mm -hmm. from that. so even though we, we um, take into account the size the growth rate all the things that come along with giant breed dogs we can still have the same expectation and make sure that it's all about the direction that we're giving them and helping them to achieve that yeah and you also talked a little bit earlier about um, you know uh, how you might not get the same longevity in a training session and uh, I think our large breed dog owners really do need to keep that in mind that their short their training sessions should be short and sweet and to the point and full of as much success as they can have because you might not have the same longevity you might have with a toller or a border collie or, or a dog of that breed yeah you know what and and you know that's an important thing to keep in mind along with the expectations so I will tell you this dog here she's my best frisbee dog Wow. Disc dog. Yes, yes. Disc, disc I think dog. it's disc. Is yeah. it disc? Is yeah. that the official? So this, are we going uh, to be, is there litigation So, so that Whammo doesn't monetize this video, <laughs> it's disc. Say. 
Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, sir. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, one of the things that I have taught her because she loves to chase is to catch a frisbee, a, a disc. Yes. Um, and she is probably my best dog at catching a disc. Yep. Now, I can't do it for 20 minutes. Right. She gets about three or four good throws. Um, she tracks the frisbee really well and she catches it and brings it back. But that's it. Right. So right. we're not going to go out for an hour. You know, I don't expect her to, to, to do it repetitively, but I still have that high expectation that she runs, she catches it and brings it right back to hand. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that's another thing, you know, just a simple retrieve. Oftentimes I hear, oh, it's a hound or it's a this or it's that. It's never going to retrieve. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. You just <laughs> it, need to unlock it, that. Yeah, um, you, you need to make some value. And, and oftentimes um, it's not about the item itself. It's about you. Right. Yeah. And if we can build value for you, all of that translates through, whether it's a giant yeah. dog or a little dog. I love that approach. I love that uh, idea. Uh, and we often talk about it in, in classes, you know, we might be using something like food as a resource that the dog immediately finds valuable, or maybe it's toys for your dog at home. But uh, we're going to shift that value from these things onto you. And there are some unique ways that we do it on this channel. We have lots of videos that talk about that. But um, really shifting some of that value over to you can be even more important when you have some of these great big uh, large dogs. Yeah, well, and especially um, uh, dogs like this that are sight hounds, they're bred to run things down. That's mm -hmm. what they do. And that's another thing that you often hear with whippets, greyhounds, other things you can never let them off leash because they have such strong prey drive. That may be the case, but uh, just like, um, you know, uh, border collies have strong herding drive, yep. um, we can discourage them from herding things we don't want them to. I can discourage this dog from chasing things that I don't want her to. Right. But again, it starts with that relationship with us first. Now, as a professional dog trainer, you have both professional and some personal experience with uh, some of these giant breeds. Yeah, I, you know, I didn't start being a dog trainer. I um, just got an Irish Wolfhound. I'd always wanted one. I can't actually tell you why I wanted one, but I just thought they were really, really cool. And uh, I quickly figured out that uh, when you have an animal that's basically the size of a small pony living in your house, there's a few little things that you can do to make life a little bit easier. Okay. Um, from everything from um, where they sleep at night, to how they get around, to what you need to do with them at the vets and other things in their lives. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about that. So if, if uh, maybe one of our prospective large breed dog owners is thinking about getting a large breed dog, what sort of things are they going to need uh, that are unique to the large breeds? Yeah, well, we need to think about all parts of their life. And first things first, you know, it's not just about the food or the ball. Um, it's about what the eventual size of the dog is going to be. Now, Sky, actually, I will tell you, is the smallest wolfhound that I've ever had. Um, most of them, I've always had males. She's the first female I've had. Most of the males have been quite a bit bigger, um, still quite fit, but just a little bit bigger overall. So little things like where do they sleep at night? Um, how do you contain them when they are puppies? You know, at about a year old, uh, these wolfhounds will be a hundred plus pounds of gangly puppy. Sure. So there are not a lot of crates that can sort of comfortably contain them. So do you have a place in your house where you can contain them with some gates? Because management is key when we know we can't supervise. Yeah. Um, how do you get them to and from things? You know, if you're driving a little Toyota uh, car right now, you're not going to be fitting one of these in the back back seats. Right. Okay? So having a van or an SUV or something uh, to help them get around. And SUVs, even though they're great for space, um, can actually also be proved difficult for them, the giant breeds, because of the high step in height. So okay. maybe ramp or other things that uh, um, can help them with that. Does your vet, if you've researched one yet, do they have the capabilities to do some of the diagnostic work on some of the bigger dogs? Okay. You know, most vet offices don't have a table that this dog can fit on. Sure. And, and I've had situations where dogs have had to be x-rayed and I've actually had to go in and hold half the dog because we can only fit half the dog in the x-ray table. Wow. So lots of things like that, that you really have to think longer term, not just little young puppy right now. You mentioned uh, briefly about, uh, you know, management, some management ideas. We know that um, crate training, uh, we often suggest for, you know, some breeds that are certainly smaller than Sky. We'll bring that puppy uh, in their first night's home with their, uh, in their new home into the bedroom. Would that be something that you can still do with one of these large breed dogs? You know, you certainly can. You know, having a crate in the bedroom is a great way. I'll admit uh, every puppy that comes into my house sleeps in my bedroom, um, mainly because I don't want to get out of bed to quiet them at night. I want to yeah. be able to reach down and reassure them without getting out of bed, without causing a fuss, without having to really wake up the puppy that everything's okay. But do note with their growth rate that um, that will have to be a pretty frequent change of crates. These guys gain about five pounds a week. Wow. That's literally what their growth rate is for at least the first eight months. Yep. Uh, that tends to slow down at about a year but they grow till almost two years so you know 
there's a lot of stages that they go through. So even though we can start them just like the little dogs, um, there are a few more steps along the way to get them to uh, adulthood. I guess maybe for our uh, prospective large breed puppy owners, you know, where are they going to get information, suggestions about what they should feed and what, what is, should their expectation be for quantity? Yeah, so uh, like anything else, your breeder or uh, a breed club uh, um, is a great spot to go for general information. Uh, my Wolfhound breeders, I've got several, come on over here, Kelly. I've got several here that are excellent uh, um, breeders and have a, are, they're really great resource for me. I know exactly what they've been feeding all the way along. I know how much to expect. They've also been in the breed for years. These are not sort of new breeders. Um, and with the phenomenal growth rate, there's there's some things to take into consideration that you wouldn't necessarily know. Um, we really try and slow down their growth a little bit to prevent um, things getting, get, the dogs getting sore from okay. growing pains. Interesting. Um, or even just things developing a little bit wrong. So we're very careful about protein levels and some other things. So your breeder or the breed clubber is an excellent place to start for that thing. Um, a lot of your vets do have some great information, but they may not be... Um, uh, as in tune to the breed specifically, sure. okay? So each giant breed is a little bit different, whether it be Danes or, or a lot of our burners. We see a lot of Bernese Mountain Dogs these days, a lot of those large breed dogs. You're, you know, a good breeder will be an excellent resource for that. As far as quantities, I will tell you with the phenomenal growth rate, uh, it's quite an investment um, financially yeah. to feed one of these dogs. Yep. You know, when she was a puppy growing at her highest rate, she was eating 10 to 12 cups of kibble a day. That's amazing. Yeah, so three times a day, it was, you know, two to three um, uh, cups of food per meal per day. Yeah. Um, now, she's leveled out a lot more now. She's still very fit. Um, I like to keep the dogs nice and fit. So she's on about four cups a day right now in terms of commercial food. Um, so it's a it's a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a lot, especially if you're feeding some really good, high quality foods, which we generally recommend as well. We talked a little bit about handling training for your large breed dog, and if you'd like to learn about more handling training, click that card right there. We hope you feel a little bit more prepared for your large dog breed to welcome them into your home. And on that note, I'm Ken. I'm Steve. And this is Sky. Happy training.